I'm here with Gardenia Cucci, and she's a practicing lawyer in New York City today. And uh, Gardenia, thanks for making the time. It's been an unprecedented time. You and I were talking about events, physical events that marketers have scheduled. And um, as a practicing lawyer, it sounds like you've had some experience yourself with some of your own clients that have had events that have either been postponed or, or pushed out. Maybe you could share with us that story so we could learn a little bit as marketers how a lawyer uh, thinks of that world. Sure, sure. Happy to help. Um, and just to um, just to clarify that I am not rendering any legal advice, but I am happy to give illustrative examples and things of what I'm seeing. And in this one instance, I represent a institutional client who for years hosts a limited partner meeting. This client happens to be an investment manager. Um, does quite a bit of substantial business and has used a venue to host this event for years. And it's the same venue. Uh, but because of the corona pandemic, there was concern by the client on this particular contract because given the event will no longer happen, at least not on the scheduled date, uh, both the venue and my client wanted to reschedule. That's actually important. They wanted to reschedule. It was not uh, in this instance that either party necessarily wanted to get out of their obligations. They wanted to reschedule, but my client was going to be faced with very, very high cancellation or penalty fees. So at the time that uh, this uh, event came up, it was actually before the, the WHO um, declared the pandemic. So we were not entirely sure, based on the force majeure clause, whether this was a qualifying event. Um, that would excuse both parties without any type of uh, ensuing obligation. So what we decided to do, and we do have a good relationship with the venue. Uh, if we had canceled or rescheduled at that very moment, the penalties would have been 100% of the uh, contract. So it would have been not just the actual estimated contract, but in addition to, uh, it was a, a fee on top of that at 100%. So what we did was we had conversations with the venue. The venue was able to accommodate us knowing that we had, the client had been a long stead client, was in good reputation, didn't really want to lose us as a client. And so we were able to have a very practical negotiation discussion. And they had agreed essentially to allow the client to reschedule for an event six months after the scheduled date. So within 2020, within six months, and if that actually did occur, there would be no cancellation fees. Any monies actually paid would be applied to this event and the fee would stay the same. If, however, the client didn't actually reschedule within 2020, within the six-month period, and moved it to 2021, there was going to be an additional fee. But it was nowhere near the cancellation fees that we had actually had in, built into the contract. So a lot of it was a practical discussion. A lot of it was due to the fact that the client had a good long-stead history with this particular venue. Um, but, but not a lot of contracts, not a lot of vendors are going to be that way. So I can also, if it's helpful for you, just let you know what some third-party vendors are doing, what I'm seeing. Yeah, um, that would be really super helpful. Okay. So there are, as you know, force majeure clauses in almost every contract. The force majeure contracts actually, as you know, will list various qualifying events. And if those events arise, they generally excuse both parties' obligations without further liability. But force majeure clauses are very, very narrowly interpreted. And usually, if a qualifying event, such as in this instance, the coronavirus, the pandemic, isn't really listed, to some extent, it can still be offered up. And I think that there is, um, the ABA actually came up with something today. And I think in most instances, even if uh, pandemics or epidemics are not listed as qualifying events, we can still use this clause, which is beyond a party's control that rendered the services either impracticable or impossible 
um, on a successful prevailing basis. Mm -hmm. um, so what needs to happen is that I would suggest your colleagues look at force majeure clauses, look to see whether epidemics and or pandemics are listed. And again, given that the WHO actually declared on March 11th, this pandemic, it would be a qualifying event if again, it's listed, specifically listed. Um, I would also urge you and your clients to look very closely at the notice provisions because as force majeures are really narrowly interpreted, clients are really going to have to follow by the book whatever prompt notice, prompt written notice um, is required under that contract. Um, there are other issues that need to be also proved, which is that the event was not foreseeable, which in this instance we can say that it was directly caused or it directly caused failure to um, an individual's performance under the actual contract. Um, there is the obligation also on the service provider to mitigate damages. And mm -hmm. so whether that means trying to get a different supplier uh, or trying to allow, well, most employers now are actually required to have their employees work from home, but there are, there is the obligation on the service provider to mitigate damages um, in however fashion. So- Service provider, just so I'm clear, meaning the venue? Um, in this instance, it would be the venue. Okay. Um, let's just say it was, uh, you know, a SaaS provider. The SaaS provider would look to see if, for example, he was getting, you know, third-party licenses from China, but China somehow it was not up and running. That SaaS provider would look to see if they could get other services, licenses from other providers in a country that would still be meeting the same qualifications. Interesting. That's an example. Um, and I would also urge that notices be put in rather quickly just to preserve it. Don't, don't wait. Um, even if it turns out that you or your colleagues may not have a prevailing uh, argument, you should always just put the notices in as a precautionary element. Got it. So it sounds like there's a lot of pieces here and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're actually uh, uh, reminding me why you're a lawyer and I'm not, but as a marketer, um, how, how would you suggest marketers talk with their in-house or maybe their outsource counsel? What kinds of questions should they be asking of people uh, in your kind of role or capacity that would make them more effective? And I think you covered a couple of those things in terms of looking at force majeure and looking at uh, some of the other, other provisions there. Uh, in addition yeah. to that, anything else that you'd, you'd suggest? Um, yeah, I would suggest the conversation to be had, I think, really begins with your dollar threshold. So, for example, and whatever that feels right to each particular um, individual or corporation or enterprise. But I wouldn't, you know, it, again, and it's also the, vital, the materiality of that contract with the enterprise. But generally speaking, a lot of the smaller vendors aren't really going to be able to do anything. So if you have a contract for 10,000 or less, generally I would perhaps put those aside and work on those that have a higher monetary threshold. And I would, yes, talk to your legal counsels and I would talk to whomever it is that's in charge of these third party vendor agreements and say, we should probably do a checklist of all of the force majeure clauses, of all of the material adverse event clauses. Put in a little matrix together, see what the notice requirements are. Are they immediate prompt written notice? Do you have to give notice via certified mail? Can email suffice? Um, a matrix to that extent, I think is very, very helpful. Um, some, some individuals, some of my clients have assigned contracts to other third parties as part of their business operations. And sometimes that may or may not affect uh, the original rights between whomever originally executed the documents and the vendor. So an assessment, overall assessment, prioritize operations. Dollar amounts, I think, are, are, are good to have because just smaller vendors are just not able to do much at this moment. Excellent. And uh, not to put you on the spot, but uh, I should ask this question to you earlier. If somebody wanted to get a hold of you, um, what's the best way? Or do you feel comfortable with that? And if you do, what's the best way if they have further questions on anything that you brought up and perhaps they wanted to talk with you about an engagement or what have you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. Um, 
email and it would be gardenia, G-A-R-D-E-N-I-A, at cucci, C-U-C-C-I, dot legal. That's the best way. Got it. Great. And I've got your contact information as well. So if people have questions, they could uh, certainly sure. follow. So um, yeah. excellent, Gardena. Well, hey, I really appreciate you taking time in this unprecedented time uh, to talk uh, briefly about your situation and helping marketers on our journey to free up more budget. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much.